welcome everyone here this afternoon. It's wonderful to see uh, everyone here and uh, to see such a diversity in our in our audience, which is truly a treat. I was telling Kathy, I wasn't quite sure who to expect. Um, this is, and I'm just going to take a minute to do an advertisement before I introduce Kathy. This is the very first in a series of uh, uh, seminars that we are hosting co-hosting with Edward School of Business, and this is part of the Dean's Speaker Series. Um, we're using it as a, uh, as a foundation, I guess, to begin part of our celebrations for the International Year of Cooperatives. Um, I should introduce you to my guest, not everybody knows me. My name is Lou Helen Hilson. Um, I've been a faculty member in the Edward School of Business for quite a few years. Just recently resigned and retired, sorry, from my position. And uh, I'm the director at the Center for the Study of Cooperatives, which is across the construction zone now, which is just <laughs> fired up over there. Um, we have uh, a whole series of seminars that we offer as part of the Dean's Speaker Series. <laughs> and I just want to promote the next few, just to so you can get them on your radar. Um, in November, we're not actually running a seminar because we're hosting a huge conference in uh, partnership with the cooperative sector, the Saskatchewan Cooperative Association, uh, Conseil, which is the Franklin Cooperative Association, and the Johnson Stroyano School of Public Policy. And that starts on November 1, runs to November 4. So lots of events happening um, as part of that conference, and uh, we'll be circulating posters and continuing to promote um, so you can check out our website for more information about that. There are a lot of tremendously good speakers, a very, very interesting kind of topics, and we encourage everyone to participate. Um, on, in December, the next in our speaker series will be Scott Vanda, and the date is December 3rd uh, at 4.15 in the afternoon. And Scott is the CEO of Federated Cooperatives. Uh, we're very pleased to be uh, inviting him to join us again as part of the Dean's Speaker Series. Uh, in January, we haven't quite got um, our speaker uh, nailed down entirely, but it's going to be someone from Credit Union Central Saskatchewan, uh, possibly Keith Nixon, or perhaps um, the new CEO, depending on where they're along in that process. Uh, but part of our goal as, as uh, people who are doing research on cooperatives is to share as much knowledge as we can about our large cooperatives and our smaller cooperatives and really increase awareness about them here on campus and off campus as well. So that's all part of the goals associated with, with our seminar series and we would hope that uh, you will all be able to join us for those for the conference or the subsequent seminars. And now the reason we're here today and the very patient person standing here in front. Um, it is my tremendous pleasure to introduce Kathy Barton. Kathy is the CEO of the Cooperators Group. Uh, she's come all the way from Guelph this morning to spend the day with us, and we've enjoyed our day tremendously. And she's met a lot of uh, people on campus, faculty and students, and uh, now an opportunity to meet some of our sector representatives as well. Some of you know Kathy very well, and some of you are not familiar with Kathy at all, so I'm going to give the obligatory uh, uh, bio here. Very short. Very short. Very short. Okay. Um, Kathy's been the, the CEO of uh, Cooperators uh, since 2002, but she's been very active in leadership roles within the organization and parts of the organization uh, since 1978, so a long history of working within the Cooperators itself. She's a graduate of the Master's MBA program, uh, university grad out of Manitoba with a math degree. And Kathy really uh, is very, very involved in leadership roles outside of the cooperatives as well, both in the cooperative sector nationally, internationally, but outside of the cooperative sector too. So she uh, brings with her a great breadth of experience and a great depth of knowledge. And we're really pleased to have her here. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, I just learned. <laughs> you may want to hold that to the end and see if I deserve it or not, right? I just learned this afternoon that I'm the first. So that's really a, <laughs> a huge responsibility in terms of setting the, the, the stage, isn't it? So I'm going to ask for your help as a result. I don't want this to be me standing up here 
talking. I've been talking all day. It's been a wonderful day. I had a chance to, uh, to find out far more about the Centre than I ever knew, even though we've been involved as an organization with the Centre for many years. So it's really been a wonderful day, and I've done a lot of talking. So for this to have the value that I hope it has for you, it has to be a conversation. It really does have to be a conversation. And, uh, and I will seek you out to make that happen. Now, I do know some folks in the audience, so I'm just warning them, and I'm not looking at anybody at this point, but if the conversation's a little slow to begin, I'm going to start picking on some people that I know in the audience to get it going. And they'll remain nameless at this point. So I do have this screen up behind me. I'm hoping that I'm not being uh, too uh, intrusive in terms of some people being able to see it. But not to worry, um, I, I really don't like PowerPoints, particularly with a, a fairly small group. I've only got six or seven slides. If you don't count the first one, it's, I think it's six or maybe seven. And they're really for backdrop. I, uh, I just want you to uh, have an opportunity to just see a few bullets here and there that, that might give some more context to the conversation that I hope we have over the next hour, hour and a half, whatever it is. How, how much time have we, yeah. roughly? About an hour. Okay. And there will be people who've said they've got to get up and leave. That's why they didn't want to be in the front. Too bad. You're in the front anyway. And, uh, and feel free to get up and leave when you have to. So let me just provide a little bit of context to, uh, to my conversation. You don't know me. At least most of you don't know me very well. So let me share with you that I, I really have three significant passions in my life. I have more, but I do have three that really stand out for me. The first one, of course, is my family. They would be very upset if I didn't say that, and I mean it. It's genuine. I have four boys and, and a wonderful husband, and, uh, and they are absolutely my passion. I also have a, a significant passion for what I discovered, uh, fortunately, when I was very young, and that is the cooperative system. And, uh, and that was through no deliberation on my part or nothing deliberate. It was my mother who actually applied to the cooperators on my behalf, unbeknownst to me. I was graduating from an MBA with lots of debts, and she was worried that if I didn't find a job, I'd be looking to her to help me with my student loans. <laughs> and so she was a passionate supporter, and my dad, of the co-op and credit union system for many years, so she applied to this wonderful organization in her mind. It was an insurance company in my mind. I didn't know anything about co-ops, I didn't know anything about insurance, and I thought, Oh, no, 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 I don't know about co-ops, and I certainly don't want to work for an insurance company. Um, and that actually became my third passion, was insurance, once I got into the, into the industry. And I'll say a little more about that. My passion for the co-op system um, certainly wasn't there in the, in the beginning, but there was something that pulled me to it. And I think, for me, that's what really the essence of the conversation is going to be about. Why is that? What, what was it about? this system for me that allowed me to really be who I wanted to be from a business context, involved in, in business and enterprise and, and, uh, and all of the excitement that that brought that I could use and uh, learn from and contribute to, but it was beyond that. And, uh, and I think that's where I really want the conversation to go, as I said. The co-op system's a pretty big system. Now, I'm told, I checked this out when I was at the center this morning, did I get the Saskatchewan numbers right? And um, you're saying no. What are the numbers? Well, if you look at our handy, you can search us. So, as of, <laughs> <laughs> as of December 2011, yes. there is 1,200 and something, 1,250 co ops, including credit unions, financial co ops, and memberships are over a million. But there's got to be more than 344,000 active members, so the credit unions have like over 500,000 members. Isn't that wonderful? So, my, my number is outdated and it's less than what is actually happening in, the, happening in this province. Now, then the Canadian number is wrong as well, but that means the Canadian number is even bigger than what it says here. So the message is still the same. So the perspective that I'm bringing to you today is a perspective that is not some um, sidelined, insignificant perspective that sits kind of on the periphery of what goes on in, in the economic context or the community context every day. And that is true not only in this country, but it's true in the world. We have over a billion members who are part of the co-op system worldwide. Many, many, many cooperatives in many, many, many industries from the time you're born to when you die, uh, we're there in countries all over the world. So 
I just wanted you to know that as I'm bringing my perspective is that this is not a, a, an insignificant uh, entity in terms or, or or form of institution or enterprise um, in terms of the experience that I'm speaking from. I also told you that I have a passion for insurance. That too was an acquired passion. I didn't graduate from my program saying, okay, now I want to be in insurance. But I'll tell you, once I got into the industry, this is what I learned about the insurance industry. We're there when you need us most. Honestly, you know, when I look at the devastation that happens with families, with communities, and in some cases with countries, if the insurance system wasn't there, we wouldn't have a viable economy. And I learned that fairly quickly, even though I came in with a math degree and a computer science undergrad minor. I learned very, very quickly how important it was that this industry be a thriving industry and exists not only in the developed world, but in the developing world, which is where I've been spending more of my time of late. Um, my organization is a, a fairly significant player in Canada. We write about uh, $3.5 billion worth of, uh, of premiums every year. We have just shy of $40 billion in assets under, under administration. And it's really in three tranches. We're in the investment business. We're in the property and casualty. That's your homes, your auto, your commercial, all of that stuff. And we're also in the life insurance business. And, uh, and so I see the perspective from a very broad base in terms of the three, we call them the three stools of financial services, investments, property and casualty, and life insurance business. Okay, so that's all the context that I wanted to provide you with so that you've got a little more sense of perhaps why I say some of the things that I say. Now I want to talk about the environment. So this is, this is our particular governance structure, but this is important for me to, to just spend a couple of minutes on because it really is, in, in my view, a lot of the foundation for the culture and the environment that I work within and that I hold dear. This is our board of directors at the bottom, and this is how they get there. We're owned by 45 cooperative and like-minded organizations. Not all of our members are, are formally cooperatively structured. We have farm associations. Uh, in addition to co-ops, so we, we refer to it as cooperative and like-minded. Those are 45 members who, who uh, send 118 delegates to us across a structure that we refer to as our regional committee structure. That, there's seven of them. So those 118 folks who come from our owners, these are our owners, we call them our members, our owners, uh, meet with us twice a year, all 118, uh, and, and they have a perspective on what their communities need and on the role that we should be providing in those communities, not only as an insurance company, but as a member of the community. What should we be doing more broadly? How, how should we be serving? Are we, in fact, executing on our mission? So it's not only the voice of the, of the ownership is seen through the board of directors, it's the voice of our ownership is seen through the delegate body, which is a much larger body, and, and is an, an active and dynamic voice for the organization. They, in turn, elect our board of directors. And that's where the 22 people come from. Now, some will say, and I certainly hear it when I, when I look at best practices associated with governance, that a board of 22 is way too big. You shouldn't have 22 people. You should be down to eight or nine or maybe 10 or maybe 12 at the most. Best practice is telling us that it should be, be less, not more. Well, I will tell you that my organization functions from coast to coast to coast in many, many communities across the country. Diverse communities, multicultural, geographic, lots of diversity. And my 22 members, my 22 board members are extremely committed and capable, given their diversity of perspective and experience and capacity, to bring that kind of, of intelligence to the decision making for this organization. I don't think that we are an ineffective board, um, and, and it is a big board by any other standard, these are fully engaged, very capable, and very different people. They're, they're different thinkers, so we don't get group think around our board table, I'll tell you. We get a very diverse set of folks thinking about our organization and what needs to be true for us to continue to be successful and meet the mission of the organization. So that's really the context I want to bring to, I think, some pretty serious issues that the world is facing. And um, these issues for me, as a mother, 
um, as, as a, a business person, as a member of my community, are, are pretty scary when you think of you know, where the trends are headed. I've identified the ones that, uh, that I spend a lot of time thinking about. It's not an all-inclusive list, but I'll tell you, these are pretty, pretty uh, compelling challenges that all of us are going to be facing in some way, shape, or form if we aren't already, um, that are significant issues if we're going to be able to maintain a healthy planet on which people can live, live with dignity and, and a sense of quality and fairness. And the two at the top are the ones that perhaps worry me the most in some ways. Um, and maybe it's because of my age. I know that I'm, I'm moving on. You know, I've been around for 34 years, so my time is limited. But I look out at the disengagement and the frustration and the lack of involvement in our young people around the world, and it worries the heck out of me. Because really, that is the next chapter. And what is it that we are not doing, or we're not doing enough of, or we are doing, to create the kind of disengagement, frustration, and lack of involvement and real contribution by so many of our young people? There is something inherently wrong about our systems. And I use that in its broadest context. It's all of our institutions. It's not only our organizations, our enterprises, you know, our, it, it's, it's our institutions more generally. We're not getting kids out voting. We're not getting kids engaged the way they need to be. Certainly unemployment rates um, are, are very troubling. And, and that one really, that's why I put it at the top of the list. This one is really, really scary for me. But there are other issues. Uh, environmental degradation, and, uh, and I don't think Many of us in this room would quarrel with the fact, regardless of whether you believe it's man-made or not, there is something that is not healthy about where things are going in the world. And, uh, and that worries, I know, many of us in this room as well. I had a wonderful opportunity earlier today to talk to some of you folks who are absolutely passionate and committed to try to figure out how to contribute to this issue in terms of how do we ensure that we're going to have a healthy planet years from now for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We can't just keep using and abusing and throwing back into our oceans and our air and our, and our landfills. We just can't do that. I mean, that, we all know that. Just do the numbers. I'm a math, math major. I can do the numbers and know that this is, this is not headed in the right direction. And the income equality gap that, um, that's occurring, particularly in some areas of the world, um, is, is breeding a lot of this frustration. You know, I mean, when you think that in some cases, you know, the person that's in my role is being paid 200 times more than the person who's actually out there executing on the front line, there's, there's something really wrong about that too. How fewer and fewer people are managing and controlling the resources in this world. It's just not the right place to be. And we have to change that. And that leads into the next one, and that is the, the concept that, you know, a lot of how we define economics and health and success is around growth. Growth in terms of beating this year, beating last year, what, or beating this year what you did last year. Uh, ensuring that on a quarterly basis you're able to outperform analyst expectations, or on a, an annual basis you're setting targets that are better than the targets for the previous year because that's, quote, success. And it's not good enough to have it incremental, because that'll be a disappointment to everybody. You've got to have really aggressive numbers every year, every decade. And this assumes every century. I mean, where does this stop if, in fact, all of our systems and forms of success are defined based on this, quote, growth? Where is it going to come from? How are we going to sustain that? It leads back into the previous. I know these aren't any any uh, wonderful new thoughts that you haven't already had. But when you aggregate all of this, of course, the financial sector of late with the instability around the globe, you really end up with what is most troubling to me if I bring it back to a business context. And that is that the formula that we're using is creating value and win and success that is quote, privatized. We, we define it in private terms. So, you know, and it's being held by fewer and fewer people. And so all of the wins are sitting here on this side of the balance. And the losses, the challenges, the risks, the, the payment that we have to make when things go wrong, like they did over the last four or five years, is really in the hands 
of society. There is definitely something wrong with that mix. That really just makes no sense to me, no matter who I believe is the right form of enterprise or what. It just doesn't add up. And so for me, the question is, why? What happened here? What's, what's gone on? And, um, you know, I, I, I've been thinking more out loud about this and listening to more people about this, and, and I, I've got a pretty simplistic view because I'm a practitioner. I don't, I, I'm not the minds that are in this room that are uh, far more intellectual than I am. What I've kind of boiled this down to is this. You know, our institutions years ago, perhaps centuries ago, whether they were our, our social systems, our, our, you know, our public systems, our schools, our hospitals, our, our, you know, whatever it was, or our enterprises, they, they began, I think, when there was a social need that needed to be responded to. So there was a why associated with these institutions. You know, organizations that, that sought capital sought out people who believed in their missions, the why of the organization, that's what your mission is. And they found folks who were prepared to give money to these institutions, these organizations, these enterprises, because they believed in the mission and they were prepared to support that. Good or bad, risk or not, success or failure, they believed in the mission. There was a why to the creation of the enterprise. I think that holds true with our, with our, our, uh, our other institutions, our schools, our hospitals, governments. They were created because they were answering a why. Why did they need to exist? Well, because, and it was a, it was a, a good for society. It added value to who we were as, as human beings. And then the strategies and all the stuff that we put in place afterwards around success, execution, whatever you want to call it, became the what's. And I think what's happened is now we've lost the why and we're only focused on the what. And I think as a result, we're rudderless. We're purposeless. And, and a lot of this is happening around the globe because I think we've lost, really, why these organizations, these institutions, these systems existed or needed to exist in the first place. And we're so focused on what. And what is the what? What are you going to do for me three months from now is the analyst on Wall Street. What are you going to be able to pay me at the end of the year is the shareholder dividend question. Or what will the, will the share price be if I invest today and a year from now? It's, it, those are all what's. Those aren't why's. Those aren't missions. Those are what's. But I don't hear very many people in any of our institutions, quite frankly. I'm not only talking about our corporations. I'm talking about our institutions more generally. I don't hear very many people talking about the why anymore. They talk a whole lot about the what. And that, for me, is the challenge. What do we do differently? What do our, our academics do? How do we teach our young people? How do we reconstitute our enterprises? How do we rethink all of our systems to return to the why? I know I'm doing a lot of talking again, and I said I wasn't going to do that. Mm -hmm. So give me some reaction to that. Yeah. Um, I really like what you're saying, and it jives very well with a number of commentators in recent years. Uh, well, as long ago as 1944, Carl Polanyi was talking about the Great Transformation and the disengagement of the economic from its social embeddedness. And I think that's part of what you're talking about. And in recent times, uh, discussion around economic models, that economics is itself the enemy, as one commentator put it. That uh, economics has become cut off from its history of a highly socialized understanding. Uh, and so if you think of Adam Smith, and you know, many people think they know Adam Smith, but they only know the little bit of Adam Smith that they reproduce. Adam Smith was incredibly concerned with the ethical and the moral and reciprocity and, and issues like that. So I, I, you know, I think you're talking about something that is a very important part of the story. And indeed, uh, some philanthropists in, in uh, Alberta have just uh, given money to the Haskell School 
to return the curriculum in that school to something that pays attention seriously to ethics, to corporate social responsibility, to the values that are at the heart of any economic engagement. So we also have, yeah. I'll just underscore that. I don't think I can say it better than you did it as well, but just to underscore that. Economics is really the theological backbone of, of business academia. And it is the discipline which has been the most resistant to change of all the disciplines, not only within business, but everywhere, um, at least for at least the last 30 years. So I really underscore that, that if there is going to be a change, and if part of that change can come from business schools, um, changing the economics curriculum may be one of the highest leverage and simplest interventions that can be done. It's not held in place by global um, accreditation the way that, for example, medicine and professions are. Right. So I think it's maybe a very, very worthwhile uh, point of intervention. Thank you. Yes? I was really struck by the first uh, bullet point there on the slide about lack of youth engagement. I'm wondering, uh, maybe a question for you. When you look at your industry being in insurance, like, do you sense within sort of the rising generation young people are real, they're becoming less risk averse. They're, and I got to use maybe a sample size of one that I'm most familiar with yeah. in my life. That they, they grew up in an era which I, I would classify as prosperous, a lot of abundance. They've never seen double-digit interest rates. Uh, they've never lived through, we've had these recessions, but no, no huge depression, no world war, or anything like that. I see young people that, um, that for them, it's it's like you can control all the lead. I can just, I can, they'll, they'll always be the prosperity, they'll always be this abundance. So are they less willing to really carry insurance or really be forward thinking in that era, in that era, area? Mm -hmm. um, that's what I see just in, in my brief small sample size. Does anyone help? Yes, please. And I'll come back to the question. Yeah. If I could add to what he's just said. Yeah. Um, I think that in this country, our youth pay for their education. There's no free education like there is in Norway and Scandinavian countries. Uh, through taxation, they pay for these things. The, our, our young people are coming through with great debt, and they have to work at several jobs to pay these debts off. And where's their time to get involved? And, and you know, I mean, really, truly involved. And, and they may be hit and miss, but they, and so we don't see that, you know, that general engagement of youth because of these, a lot of this financial work, the obligations they have. So let's hear from some younger faces in the room. I see a few. Well, there's, there's a couple here, too. And there's some down there. What's, what's your perspective on this? Well, I come from a very different... Uh, oh, sorry. OK, go ahead. I was looking at the wrong guy, but you're both young, so you get ready, because you're next. <laughs> I come from a very different background. Uh, my parents, I'm very lucky they paid for my school. Like Mom said, she, as long as we're doing good, she'll pay for both me and my sister's schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very lucky in my work career to make, well, ridiculous amounts of money for someone my age. So, and I'm thinking finance, so I can't wait till the interest rates hit double digits. <laughs> That's the danger of a sample of one, right? <laughs> So, so let's hear from another, another voice in that sample. Let's broaden the sample size. Yeah. For me, is I'm, I'm right now studying peace building, and especially, and you a couple times mentioned about system, what our society has system. But those are what you point out, except the first two, is most is previous solution of our society competition and growth for like, for example, the environmental the GMO is the solution for hunger of the world and those kind of past generation solutions become present generation's problem. 
So what, what should I do? How we design our society is that we still carry on past idea, previous idea of those things without redesigning. Is that just each specific question, that problem? Is that and we can solve that problem without redesigning the structure? That's my question. Yeah, that's a that's that's a really important question. Mm -hmm. Would you classify yourself engaged? Are you engaged? Not not to some a partner, I mean. Are you <laughs> would you classify yourself engaged? Yes? Okay, and what about the folks sitting behind you? Yeah. Well, I can try. Uh, what do you mean by engage uh, will depend on operational definition, but uh, I will look at what you say from different perspective, but the major aspect of it is what you said in terms of need for rethink of the system, which is exactly why I personally uh, is in public policy. The way the system is structured does not really encourage cooperative itself, because here, my observation since I came to Canada, is different from back in Nigeria, where cooperative is uh, prompted. People join cooperative because their neighbors, they know each of them. And not. But here, I kept wondering, you may not even know your neighbor, and you may be living there for five, six years. Nobody just in the elevator, everybody just looking to the number, and then you go out and go out. So, so there should be need for that rethink so that people are not suspicious of each other and that makes things easy. And also the orientation that every problem has to be solved by law. Instead of using judgment in some cases, everything has to go through the uh, uh, what is it, justice system. It's another problem that makes people not to be engaged. So to avoid trouble, you just keep to yourself and then you can be part of any other thing. So you go to work, come back home, and stay out of trouble. So how do you engage? So there is a need for that rethink that people need to think and rethink and see people as partners rather than using system to punish people or malicious uh, punishment. That's just my observation. So you're hitting on a really important concept that I want to build on, but I, I saw another did you yeah. yeah. I, I was sitting here thinking of so what's the answer to, to your question. But, um, when you talk about youth engagement, I don't have extensive experience in this, but internationally, with the volunteer work that I've done, youth engagement comes to the top of the list in most, if not all, the cooperatives that I've been involved with <coughs> and internationally. So I, I had in the back of my mind that, there was, that it was something cultural, but I don't think it is. I think it really of the institution. But I think there's also something there in terms of um, culturally, those of us who, you know, like the children of the 60s kind of thing, um, now at uh, retirement age and, and beyond, um, took a leadership, a different kind of leadership role in society than what had been previous, where you had a different kind of family structure, that kind of thing. I think all of that fits into this picture somehow on the social side. It's um, maybe we're not making room and creating the opportunity for youth engagement. We're filling the, the spots in leadership in so many in so many ways, particularly in the corporate sector, is would be my my observation. And that's not a criticism, it's that sometimes we need to do a better job of opening the door to the Engaging others means you open the door and let engage someone. Right. Not just say, so where are they? Why aren't they here? Why aren't they doing this? So I think we have a personal responsibility. So there's a, there's a theme, there's, there's a connection starting to occur here that I want to bring to the fore, but I've ignored this side of the room. Did I miss anyone that, yes? I just want to say something that, um, what's really, it's more of a comment, I and mean, what's really refreshing for me to hear is that you're beginning to get to the kind of larger existential questions, right? You, you talked about why, and, and it uh, often um, 
business doesn't ask a lot about why it talks about the what. And I'm reminded about my niece in, in New Zealand who's um, she's young, she cares deeply about social issues. Um, she's gone through business school, very traditional business school. And um, so these are kids who are doing all right, but they're still struggling to be engaged in the economy. Finally got a job, and it's for a, a corporate company. And I was, uh, I come from a business background at all, and I was listening, she had gone away for a retreat, and I was listening to her experience, and she was talking about how they all wear uniforms. And um, I said, oh, uniforms? And she said, oh, well, it, it, it's pretty standard. And um, she went on to talk about other things. And I, I think what shocked me is, here's a person that cares deeply about social issues about, about the environment, and yet the business model is kind of slotting her into a way of being where you don't even think about these things. And you don't even think about the system that you've been enculturated into. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's, uh, we're kind of not, um, we're missing the boat, I think, in terms of going to those wider, those deeper existential questions that I think a lot of young people actually want to engage with. Well, and I think you're all now starting to hit on, on the theme that I want to bring forward in terms of bringing this into a context that's a little closer to me around cooperatives. But what you were talking about, I think, is perhaps we are, we are those of us who now are past our prime, have, have maintained, encouraged, built these structure systems that, to your point, perhaps aren't engaging or not allowing the kind of engagement or the forms of engagement that I think the gentleman from Nigeria was also referring to is, are, are there systemic barriers now that we're creating in some ways uh, to the ability to bring this thinking and this engagement and this influence and this contribution into our systems more broadly? And I think the answer in some ways is yes. And, uh, and I want to talk about this now in a little closer to home within the co-op context just by way of show of hands, how many of you are not familiar with co-ops? What a cooperative is? You're all familiar with what a cooperative is. This is really special for me. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I stood in front of a group and nobody put up their hand saying, "Well, not really." I mean, I kind of know, but not really. This is great. All right. Well, then I can cut to the chase on this. You know, those of us in the co-op system throw up a lot of issues that we think are problems for the co-op system. These are the kinds of things that you'll hear. Lack of recognition, we don't get the media paying attention to us, access to capital is a problem. We throw up all of these, these and you know, I mean, I guess sometimes, you know, you can kind of put some justification around some of this. But, but I think there is a real danger for us in the system to use this as uh, an excuse for a lot of self-inflicted issues that I think the co-op system owns and needs to fix. Because what we're talking about this afternoon, um, I think really speaks so well to, now I'm biased, I, I passionately believe, I declared my bias, I passionately believe in the co-op system as a form of enterprise that really does get at the more systemic issues, the broader issues, the more societal important issues around community, health of community, health of planet. But, you know, this stuff gets in the way because, quite frankly, a lot of Canadians don't know what co-ops are about. And we say, oh, woe is us. How do we get this stuff into to the bigger domain and, you know, where everyone is just embracing co-ops because they love us to death and, and we don't have to do any work? That's not going to happen. It hasn't happened in the, you know, 150 or 200 years that co-ops have existed. And, uh, and so let's get on with it. Like, let's stop worrying about this stuff and get on with what the real problems are. And I'll tell you what the real problems are. The real problems are that the co-ops that don't worry about this and really worry about doing what they're meant to do are typically the smaller co-ops. The ones that are just starting out, the ones that I know there's some wonderful work going on in Nigeria and Kenya and other countries. You go to these co-ops, they're not worrying about whether the media is picking them up or not. They're, they're worried about how they're going to reach out to more and more members, how they're going to work with each other. Whereas the more developed co-ops, mine included, start worrying about emulating our competition. Um, if the public doesn't know what we are as a co-op, we drop the name and we make another name up so that you know maybe they don't have the negative stereotype anymore. We almost, in my mind, become embarrassed about the fact that we're cooperative 
and we hide it. We stop working with each other, my co-op included. We, f we hunker down, we focus on our competition and how we're going to incorporate best practice. And then the whole lingo is about best practice. What's best practice, best practice in governance? Well, we've got to reduce our board, and we have to have less, less representation, and we have to do this, and we have to do that. And then I hear, and this just drives me crazy, I hear business leaders saying, well, you know, we've got to make sure the business is running well as a business, and then we can do this co-op stuff. And I hear some of the academics who are really passionate saying, no, 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 you have to make sure you're a cooperative first. And then the business will happen, and maybe not as well as you might like, but now not the academics in this province. <laughs> but, but I hear this either or going on, right? I mean, make sure the business is running and then we can do the other stuff. Quite frankly, none of that is right. We're a cooperative business. We're integrated. This is our DNA. This is who we are. We run good, solid insurance cooperatives, not insurance companies that happen to be cooperatively structured, or not good credit unions that are banks that happen to be credit union or democratically structured. We run good cooperative whatever. And, and I think many of us who get into the more developed frameworks lose that fact. And so these become the all-encompassing or the more important issues for us when in fact the real issues are why aren't we out with a compelling story in our communities, bringing that story to our, to our customers or our potential members and to each other, supporting each other and being proud of who we are as co-ops? And I think that would go a long way to, to solve some of these problems, quite frankly. Because, yes, sorry. No, no, I, just, I, I mean, I was just going to say, language is immensely you know, powerful within the language and it can be immensely violent too, right? It's mm -hmm. deciding on you know, which sorts of silence and you're choosing, it's going to greatly dictate how you act. And I mean, just hearing you talk about, yeah, we talk about, you know, business. I mean, when your business translates into many sort of environments, and talk, we don't really about what we do, but it can really create this dangerous slippage, right? <coughs> absolutely, absolutely. Which is what I think the danger is when you hear organizations talk about, you know, the concept of sustainability, and they put a sustainability leader in place, and that person now is opposed to somehow right. magically turn the organization into a sustainable organization. Not going to happen. If you're going to be a sustainable organization, it's going to be in your DNA. It's going to be how you think, how you plan, how you measure, how you deliver, and it's going to be everybody. It'll be the entire organization. It won't be a sustainability department, right? And that's where you get into all of this, where you, it just becomes very superficial. So what I think the world needs is this very lofty goal that the International Cooperative Alliance has established and this isn't the only thing the world needs, obviously, but this is what, what my view of, of the world is, and I've only got a limited amount of time and energy, and so I choose to focus on the co-op system. I belong to the International Co-op Alliance Board, and we have established this very lofty goal that by 2020, the co-op system will be the model preferred by people. And it's as simple as that. It's not customers or members or staff or, or politicians or regulators. It's people. And we will be the acknowledged leader in sustainability. Now, sustainability for us is, is the broader context. It's human dignity, it's quality of life, it's fairness, it's a healthy planet physically, it's a healthy planet emotionally, ethically, socially. It's, it's the broader definition that sustainability actually for us uh, really encompasses. And finally, we will be the fastest growing form of enterprise. Those are pretty lofty goals. But they're doable, and we think they're doable because all of the issues that we were talking about earlier in terms of, uh, of identity and voice and connection and engagement of our, of our young people is possible in, in systems that are, in fact, structured to provide that. Now, I think there's a huge challenge for the co-op system in that we have the traditional institutional barriers and systemic barriers that are not allowing the kind of engagement, I think, that our young people need. Um, we have to change substantially how we view this value that we have, one of our principles of voice, because voice to a young person now isn't getting in a car and driving down to an AGM and voting at an AGM. Voice to a young person is being able to connect virtually to a community that they can relate to and they have voice and influence, et cetera. We've got to do a much better job as a, as a cooperative system 
to bring our own practices and our ethos and our culture into a more relevant framework for generations to come. But we have a plan, and, uh, and my organization certainly bought into this plan in terms of the, the work that we're doing from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, again, that broader context from ensuring that we are part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, we've got lots that we've got to do. We're doing a lot of stuff right, but we're doing a lot of stuff wrong yet. So there's lots of work to do. We've got to keep rolling up our sleeves. Um, but the co-op model, if you reflect back on some of your comments earlier and, uh, and the discussion and some of the points I made around uh, the challenges that we face, very formidable challenges that really are questioning our viability as a, as a healthy place to live. Uh, really, I think, in, in many ways, uh, get some of the solution, at least, identified with this structure called cooperative that is a very successful co uh, structure, a billion members worldwide, not very well known. We own that. We can change that as leaders in the co-op system, and it certainly will respond to, to many of the ills that, uh, that are, are facing this planet. So I want to take you back to, whoops, how do I go backwards? There we go. That one. I want to take you back to that one, and I want you to tell me where you think I'm naive. What will get in the way of our lofty goals? Where am I naive? You were talking about the economic system and, uh, and the rigidity and the need to really rethink Yes. Yeah, I'd say a little bit different. The economic system, yes, but it's the belief system that underlies the economic system, and particularly right. the ideology, which is taught and reinforced right from day one in business schools. So I would call it the ideology, the belief system that says that says that what you do doesn't matter. Making money is all that matters because, and then they'll roll out the math, because the math here shows that making money always translates that monetary value is a perfect measure of social value, and your, and your income is a perfect measure of your worth as a human being, and that's very elaborately laid out with all the equations and so forth. Right. There are humanistic economic systems that, you know, they don't get taught. And, and that is a very significant challenge for the co-op system as well, that we're struggling with. How do we provide leadership in relation to metrics of health and success that are not the traditional ones? How do we incorporate that into our own thinking, our own organizations, when in fact we continue to be measured internally and externally by the same traditional factors? Yeah, you have to. Yeah, no, I'm just, just going to say that I think uh, maybe the naivety or the risk that comes with some of these things is, is see cooperatives depoliticize themselves to the extent that, uh, you know, economics is always political. I mean, I think that's the point that folks are making too. You know, there's always other values and social beliefs driving these sorts of natural economic systems, right? And I don't mean that cooperatives ought to be uh, in, running for office or anything, but it's certainly trying to put a polemical framework on what the offerings are. Because if you go back to youth engagement, I think young people around the back end of that spectrum recognize that bottom point. Uh, and I think they just need to see uh, an alternative sort of perspective or, or examples. You know, and maybe that comes out of back end, not just saying, well, what was us? We can't communicate those values. But I think it's 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 really recognizing that yeah, we can't just use the discourse of you know business, we've got to find different kinds of relays, different words. But also, you know, remember that we are sort of political actors too, we're not just economic, social, environmental actors. I think that's really important. Good point. Yeah. Yes? I'm not sure that, I think you made some, I don't know, you enjoyed your talk, but I think that you made a good point of why, why different co ops form in different ways, they form a certain purpose. So if you think of these co ops now as shells, a certain purpose, the purpose is that. The younger right now might, might not I need a co-op to throw that right now. Like they don't need, I grew up in a small town in Saskatchewan, the co-op was the main grocery store. Because have been Saskatoon, you know, so we do safely. You don't necessarily need that. But, you know, my, when my parents grew up in Rose Town, they, they needed a co-op, that sort of thing. And so they're, they're supportive. 
So I think what the co-ops now, I think the cures that are mature at this point can do is not sort of necessarily try to draw the youth in yours, but when they decide what what they need, you can be there to support them to grow their co-ops and provide the resources that you do have to, to allow them to grow quickly because of course growing a co-op and starting something is, is difficult, but if you have resources, you guys do have the capital to support new co-ops or people who think right. they design and they decide, well, they do want to have grocery store system in Saskatoon that it is only fair trade and such sort of thing and that you guys can be there to support capital to start that. that, that. Mm -hmm. And so by that, the cooperative system grow, but I think that then you get that engagement. So I think trying to draw them into, you know, just as someone said that in the 60s there was sort of a turn that people just did things differently than their parents. Well, this generation have different things that are important to them as well, and, uh, and they'll. I think the system set up for co op is something that speaks from what I see of people in their 20s and 30s, something that they think would like to speak well to them, but it's sort of probably getting started. And do you think part of that is because we, uh, once we get established, we do try to emulate the Sobeys and the and the Walmarts, and therefore, why, you know, What's the difference? what would be the difference yeah, at that like stage? On Main Street, yeah. and the next big uh, co-op store is awesome. It's yeah. just the exact same Safeway, the exact same. It's, so uh, what's the differentiator? Yeah, so what's the point? You go to Credit Union, like the same small town Saskatchewan, Credit Union one time was sort of a small groups that was sort of the collective to, to try to, to do these things, but but now, you go to South Tunia, you go right across the street to TD or Royal Bank, you know, treating me different ways, what's the difference, sort of. Okay. So. And Bernie, do you want to jump I in? Just, I just wanted to follow on that because I think when you first started talking, it goes back to the, uh, we talked about why cooperatives were important, that's the history of what there was a need, what was the need. And now, today, what we have to do is to ask, answer that question of why. Why the cooperatives? Why the Finity Credit? Why concentra? Why whatever what they know cooperative institution that it is? And I don't and I think what we're busy doing is telling them that we're as good as the T D bank or we're as good as whoever yeah, as opposed to why the fact you're And I would suggest that, that you know the whys are pretty compelling today. I mean, is this not a good start to say, okay, so Surely to God, you can drive out some pretty important whys when you look at some of the, the needs that our world is facing. But, we, uh, but we'll lose that, as you say, if we're just trying to emulate and be as good as folks who may not be as interested in some of those whys. Yeah. A lot of the youth engagement as well is sort of interesting and circular. So because I think some of the drivers, you say that, drive for growth, drive for extreme health. I think there's a lot of youth today that aren't driven by that. I think they want people want a comfortable living. They want to have time with their family. They want to. Like, I don't want to separate my family to be part of this or that sort of thing. So you're still you're pitching models of saying, well, if you get engaged in this, this cooperative, that that's what that's your goals are still that, and not with this. It was interesting when we uh, embarked on our sustainability commitment. We call it our journey. Uh, before we established any sort of framework or strategy or any you know, kind of concrete thinking, we went out into our organization and we spent a fair amount of time going across the country talking to our, our folks out in, in the various positions, our frontline staff, you know, our claims people, our sales people, that kind of thing. So we had a bunch of focus groups and the one theme that came back was, it's about time that that the more senior ranks of the organization are finally getting it and putting the commitment into what you represented your organization to us when we joined. We joined this organization for a number of reasons. And and the most important one of those reasons is that we thought you believed in being a part of the solution, the broader sustainability solution. And yes, you've been doing some things, but you haven't embraced it the way you should. And that was such a clear message and it was it was from our frontline, typically young people who were saying, get on with it and we're with you and we'll work hard and we'll execute, but we think it's important and you need to step up, senior guys. It's about time. Yeah. I saw another hand. I'm sorry. Yes. And that comes into what I was going to say. Maybe I'm romanticizing it. Maybe you can correct me or Harold, but it seems to me like 
in the the pressure to be a business and conform and focus on the bottom line that some of the what I think of as these historic amazing leaps and firsts and commitments and movement building things that the cooperative sector has done, it's a lot tougher to see that kind of action and commitment. Now it is, yeah, like I said, maybe it wasn't all like, yeah, let's all work together all the time, but at least in the, okay, at least in some way, it was more of the, the sector's culture that, that everybody did a lot more work together and work on systemic change. And I guess that's part of what I see the challenge is that even in articulating the why, we need like what the cooperators are doing with sustainability and impact to step forward and say, we're going to do something about it and here's what. Because I think people we are interested in you would be engaged with this thing to buy into. You're shaking your head. What are your thoughts? Oh, well, I think the, the idea of, of you, the lack of youth engagement is, I don't think, it doesn't ring true for me. Um, but I think that might be the perspective from where I come from, and I work with a lot of really engaged youth um, who aren't necessarily engaged in a traditional structure. Ah, there's the key. Say it again. That's the important point, right? How we're measuring engagement is wrong. It's missing the point. Say it again. That was beautiful. <laughs> there's a lot of youth that are really engaged, but not in, in a traditional structure. Um, they're, they're engaged in, in a structure or an organization or a passion that they have that they've decided upon. Um, and so the, the youth, some of the youth that I know, and I hate to speak for all of the youth because they're a diverse group, but that they're not necessarily interested in plugging in how we want them to plug in, but rather about having a conversation about what we can do together. And, that's, and doesn't that take flexibility, whether it's, you know, the enterprise structure or it's thinking or it's culture or, you know, I mean, what are the business, well, I shouldn't say the business school, I'm not picking on the business schools, but, you know, what, what do you hear today in terms of the response to the crisis? You need to build resilient organizations. You need to be more resilient today than ever. You need to build resilient leadership. You need to teach your people to be resilient and embrace change. You need to be more fluid. You need to go with the flow. All of that resilience means for me far less structure, right? Far less of the traditional and more of perhaps what you're suggesting is how do we, how do we continue to have these enterprises continue with you know, a different frame of mind associated with how they function without losing entirely the ability to, to function as enterprises? And it's a, it's, a, it's a question that we kick around all the time around my teams and my board. Did, sorry? Very first business school perspective. Um, you have a market positioning challenge, and you want to tap. Um, because even in, even in the days where the mission of co ops was absolutely crystal clear and people knew why, there were still capitalist traditional firms that were welfare capitalists, that educated immigrants, that you know had business partners that were maybe 10% of. American enterprise, for example, was truly welfare capitalist. And today, you know, so there was always a blur. There were all these alternative models. You fully embraced it. Ten percent of other firms embraced it, but there was a blur. Today, the rhetoric that you're speaking of is so attractive to the probably ninety percent of non-co-op firms that you cannot tell the difference. You know, when you have Shell and you have Imperial and you have the oil sands, you know, everybody's talking about everybody's talking about corporate social responsibility. You don't have the competitive. It's it's not a legal differentiator. Mm -hmm. You know, your model is differentiated, but the rhetoric is no longer differentiated. So I think you would have to smoke out what it is about your model that produces greater human dignity. You know, and I was really intrigued by the fact that you used the word dignity earlier. Um, you know, there's more dignity to being attached to this model for employees, for communities, and so on. Um, it's more embracing and inclusive. Um, so I, I think you have to not do the same surface rhetoric that, that every corporation and every corporate model is using right now. So that's my yeah. thing is I'm listening to. Yeah. You have a challenge because I hear exactly the same thing. Yeah. From business leaders of conventional yeah. models. Though I will say, um, and I don't know how true, there are other co-op uh, leaders in the room, and I think your, your stats are similar. I will tell you that young people are pretty smart, and they can, they can smell out 
superficial rhetoric fairly quickly, and then they leave. And, uh, and I know that, um, you know, we're all being warned as business leaders that, you know, the crunch is coming, and if it's just around the corner, and if your practices are not genuine and, and bone deep, I think you're in for some pretty significant challenges as employers. I mean, I know in the insurance industry, we enjoy very high retention, um, but we have to work at it. We have to be honest with people coming in. This is who you are. This is who we are. This is, is this a match? And that's got to really be transparent. But, uh, but if it is, and there is a match of values and a match of expectation, then we, we tend to keep our folks. And, and uh, I think that organizations, it, it bodes well for organizations to be figuring that out too. Yeah. So yes, I want to come back to you, because I do want to hear from you. <laughs> well, this has been really interesting, and it's nice to meet you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, when most of our cooperatives that us older folks are aware of were formed, they were formed in communities. They were formed by people who had problems, and who worked together to solve those problems. I remember my dad buying coal, and the neighbors ordering a car to come in. I remember the being in a deep rain where the neighbors, you know, get to be in a deep rain. We get supplies. Uh, the early credit unions were in communities where people had problems in getting loans. And uh, so, so th there were these small groups. Now, we're into the third generation of that. And what they're saying that I repeat is that any people's organization without an adequate educational program will last a generation and a half. Mm -hmm. The Saskatchewan Week goal is generation and a half for 74 years. But, uh, but the problem, uh, the problem of uh, uh, the next generation's uh, learning uh, this philosophy, the principles, uh, this doesn't happen easily. And I, I think it's, it's so difficult now to get groups of people together that, that feel the needs that are reflected in our, in our cooperatives. I'm thinking of the Saskatoon Co-op with 80,000 members. And uh, without, uh, uh, without uh, learning tools to help the new members, they bring 5,000 members, new members a year. And these folks sign a piece of paper which says, I agree to, I want to be in this organization. I agree to abide by the bylaws and policies. They have no idea what those bylaws and policies are to make them any different than Walmart and Safeway, you know? But, but I, I think it's so difficult uh, to use your learning tools, like sitting around the table and talking about the, the things that my dad did when they had a beef ring. We don't sit around the table these days, yeah. you know, to say what, what, are the, what are the problems. Now, there's many clubs now, that are, well, the corporates are organized by people that have, that have the need, that recognize the need. We have daycare centers now, new types of clubs. I organized many corporate farms that lasted a, a, a generation, and I, and I actually helped them to wind up. The, the ones that are going on into perpetuity, and this is the cooperators and the club store, credit unions, they're into the third generations. And, uh, and, and the, the difficulty of having learning methods which help these people to really feel what this philosophy is mm -hmm. and the principles, mm -hmm. uh, I think is extremely difficult. And I think it's not well enough recognized. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's well, that, that is a great segue into having to wrap it up because I know I do. Uh, because I will leave you uh, with a positive note that, that really builds on your, on your comment. We were given a gift this year, the International Year of Co-ops by the United Nations. And I think that the world uh, co-op system will look back on the International Year as one that we used well. Now, did we do everything we wanted to? Perhaps not. But I think to your point, what it allowed us to do worldwide, including in this country. I saw co-ops coming together who had never known each other before. I saw outreach to just the average Canadian that I had never seen before. I saw creativity in organizations that wanted to use this as a segue into much more commitment to get the, the education process underway, to rethink 
what that kitchen table needs to look like today, because it won't be a physical kitchen table, but it's going to be some sort of table that replaces it. And, and I think we have really got an opportunity now, more than ever, given the effort that we've put into 2012, to use this as a door that we should be walking through into those lofty goals that I shared with you. And I think for the leaders in the room of the co-op system, we really do have a wonderful opportunity to keep this momentum up and to keep the energy up and to respond to the questions that you've been raising this afternoon. You know, I mean, how will we ensure that we're relevant and that we uh, stand out and that we continue to answer the whys that are associated with these issues? So on that note, thank you very, very much for being patient and listening. And oh, over to you. Okay. She's a completely self-regulating speaker. <laughs> No, just so I don't get into time, I was looking for questions, no need to share. But I'm holding, I'm holding your, your hands at cost if you do. Okay, so I can't leave yet. yet. <laughs> you cannot leave until we actually thank you and give you a gift on behalf of both um, the Edgar School. Let me just talk about that. On behalf of both um, the Edgar School, and very much uh, the Center for Co-ops, on behalf of both of us, I want to thank you for coming. We're having, that was Okay.